Spiro podcast, the number one spearfishing dedicated podcast in the world, or so we like to believe. That's right, all we do is sit around and talk to the world's best Spiros about spearfishing and how you can be a better Spiro like them. Today's episode is bloody awesome. It's with South African Spiro, Chris Dillon. Now, Chris picked the sport up a little bit later in life, but nevertheless has gone on to shoot some amazing fish and shoot some world records along the way. Now, uh, Chris is good mates with former guest uh, episode number 52, Noel Cameron, one of my favourite and funniest episodes. And uh, we talked to Chris about shooting some absolutely amazing fish. Like we talk about Ascension Island, shooting those big yellowfin tuna, um, absolutely massive fish. And, and he gives us sort of an insight on sort of what you've got to do to land those fish and just what to expect. Uh, it's very interesting stuff. He also gives some great tips for beginners, what should they should be focusing on. And he talks about um, his progression in spearfishing and how he really improved. And uh, that really does come down uh, to his mentors. He was fortunate enough to dive with some of um, South Africa's best divers. And uh, he's, he said it really, it really has improved his diving. So that's very interesting uh, as well. We also talk about the Boha Snapper. Uh, he holds the current world record for the Boha Snapper as well, um, and he gives a few little tips on hunting that elusive fish. So it's a very, very interesting episode, and I can't wait to bring it to you. Also, I'm flying solo this week. No Shrek at all to be heard in the whole interview, unless he's in an ad. But yeah, like he was just here five minutes ago, then something shiny um, went past the window. I think it was a chip packet blowing in the breeze, and he sort of just chased it down the street, and I haven't seen him since. So um, Shrek... Come back. So no Shrek this week. But uh, I just want to say a couple of shout-outs. We've had some love on the interwebs, and we love that. So we love your love. So uh, thanks for reaching um, out to David Cloning, um, Skeeter Trujillo, uh, Malcolm Galway. Uh, have fun in New Zealand, mate. And, of course, our old mate Harlem Ratapu over in New Zealand. Uh, we just put one of his videos up. Uh, a couple of days ago and uh, absolutely fantastic stuff i tell you what he is doing more for tourism new zealand than tourism new zealand uh, absolutely incredible footage of the new zealand coastline phenomenal stuff looks absolutely amazing the, he loses a 30 kilo kingy like it's right in his hands in this episode this video uh, absolutely amazing and they also land a 40 kilo kingy and it looks like he even eats the heart out of one of these fish so it's uh, it's pretty pretty good stuff all right, so uh, normally I'd say we'll throw it over to Shrek, but uh, Shrek's not here, so I'm just going to awkwardly throw this over to myself. Guys, Adreno's awesome Easter sale is back on. It's absolutely massive. Pick yourself up something fancy, maybe a new Manny Sub gum, maybe an Aimright, maybe a Rob Allen, maybe a new wetsuit, anything your heart desires. It starts March 17, goes through till April 15. It's be quick while stocks last. And the best thing about it is you can use the Noob Spiro code at checkout. And that will save you a further $20 on all purchases over $200. And that's on top of your already discounted prices, sale prices. That's absolutely fantastic. Big thank you to Adreno for sponsoring the show while we're at it. So do yourself a favor. Get online at spearfishing.com.au or visit them in store. Mate, can't go wrong. Today, we are speaking with Chris Dillon all the way from Cape Town in South Africa. Now, he's been spearfishing a long time, but recently he's had an absolute dream run spearfishing the world. He's been shooting some absolutely amazing fish. Uh, we're going to speak about those fish today. Uh, 55 kilo wahoo, uh, 27 kilo pick handle barracuda, amongst other things. Uh, he's been spearfishing with some of the world's best recently too, some of the world's uh, best uh, New Zealand uh, Spiros and Australian Spiros and the likes of Rob Torelli. And uh, we're going to learn a few things today here off Chris. Chris, welcome to the show. Yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, 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 always listen to Noob Spiro and I really enjoy your show, so thanks for putting it on. Mate, is it, you're, either, you're either a little bit crazy or you're a liar, so I'm not sure that there's too many people that listen to us. But anyway, let's move on. Chris, uh, why don't you uh, why don't you tell us where you began spearfishing, how that sort of came about? 
Yeah, I think like many divers, uh, my father was a spear fisherman, not a very good one, but he had a spear gun that used to lie in the corner of his diving cupboard. And as kids, sort of the age of three and four, my brother and I used to often take the gun out and look at it. And, and uh, we were always stealing his scuba tanks and using them up in the bottom of our swimming pool. And <laughs> then we used to go down to water hockey with him from the age of five or six and play hockey on the bottom of the pool. And we sort of had a love of being in the water. So when I was about 14 or 15, I took part in a triathlon that they used to have in Zimbabwe. And I saw you had Rob Gates on your show a few few months back. Um, so I actually played underwater hockey and was competed against him in some of those triathlons. Uh, it was called the Tony Dawson Triathlon in, in memoriam of Tony Dawson. And we used to play underwater hockey. We used to spearfish and do a scuba diving competition. And on one of those um, uh, triathlons, I think I was 15 years old, I shot my first decent fish in Lake Kariba. Uh, lucky enough not to bump into as many crocodiles as Rob Gates, yeah. but uh, that was when it really started. I remember that first bream, it was about a two or three kilogram bream, shot it on Sampa Karuma Island, and from that moment I was hooked. I knew I had to shoot many more fish in my life. Oh, brilliant. Great story. Um, mate, before we go on, have you got any stories about Rob Gates that you can share with us? Um, I, I didn't know him as well, but I knew some of those Kariba divers and I dived with them um, frequently. And the kind of rule of thumb was never dive anywhere within one mile of the shore. So we would dive the tree lines that were always at least, say, two kilometers offshore. And then you were fairly certain in those days of not getting bitten by a croc. And I dived a lot. This was in so the early 80s. Um, these days, you wouldn't even think about diving in Kariba. There's so many crocodiles, um, you would you definitely die. <laughs> Is that right? <laughs> but Rob wasn't the only guy who got chomped by crocs. Quite a few of the other um, spearers who got a bit too brave. Generally, it was diving close to the shore yep. in competitions and the, the guys were pushing their luck because crocs need to take you somewhere to rot. So they'll kill you and then they drag you into their lair leave you in there for a few weeks so you get nice and soft and then they can eat you easily. So if you're far from shore, you've got a much lower chance of getting bitten. But yeah, um, I did bump into a cro croc once, but it was quite a small one and he went one way and I went the other way at high speed. Uh, very difficult to hold your breath after meeting a croc in the water. <laughs> I bet. Absolutely, I bet. Mate, you, uh, you've dived with a lot of South Africa's um, more prominent Spiros. Was there a mentor that you had in those early days that sort of, once you got started, took you under his ring and really showed you what to do? Yeah, I think I've actually met my mentor in the lot, mentors probably in the later years of my spearfishing. I, I probably had a big gap um, between the age of sort of 25 and, and 40. Mm -hmm. And then at 40, I really picked the sport up again. Um, I started diving with Adrian Creel, um, a springbok spearer, and another um, spearer called Mark Jackson from PE. Both of them competed. I know Mark's been to a few worlds, uh, done pretty well there. Um, uh, very keen divers. Very laid back guys. Um, Audra and Creel's nickname is AK, uh, like the gun. <laughs> and it's for good reason. Uh, he's, uh, he, he shoots a lot of big fish. Um, he's really calm in the water. He's probably the only person I know who'll swim back up to the boat and, and load a you know, 30 kilogram fish onto the boat and, and, and swim away, and no one will even see him later. He's like, Who shot that fish? <laughs> he's extremely calm. So I've learned a lot from diving with the both of them and, and some of their friends. And uh, it's been, you know, it's like any sport. If you want to get to the top of your game, you need to play that sport with people who are better than you. Yep. And for me, you know, Adrian's pushed me uh, to, to really improve my diving and uh, really improve my fish sense as well. He's, they both have brilliant fish sense. And uh, Mark Jackson is probably the most persistent spear fisherman I've ever met. He, when we were on a trip to Angola, one, one, I think it was in February this year, he took three days to shoot a large dusky grouper of about 25 kilos. Every day he went back to this place and saw it, he couldn't get it, and he just kept going, and eventually the third day he got it. So yeah. he taught me a lot about just persevering, and both of them love to dive. You know, they're absolutely passionate about it, as I am. And it's really fun to dive with good friends who are, who are guys who just love it. And we often talk on the phone and share stories and pictures. And But I, I'll share some of the learnings that I've gleaned from both of them when we talk about that later in the show. Yeah, beautiful. And I'm sure uh, you're good mates with Niall Cameron. Um, you, you've got a holiday house near near him. Now, surely Niall's taught you a thing or two. Yeah, Niall, um, Niall you know, is a keen diver, and that was how really I got back into being addicted to spearfishing. I went on a holiday to the Eastern Cape, and I chartered a, a, a day out on a boat to go fishing. Couldn't find a spear fisherman. I didn't know Niall was a spear fisherman. Two of us got out to the fishing grounds, dropped our fishing rods down, and started chatting. 
Mm. And then I said to him, do, do you like spearfishing? He says, yeah, I absolutely love it. <laughs> so I said, I'm the same. <laughs> oh, and within two minutes, we pulled our lines up and run back to the car, <laughs> got all his kit out, and we were spearfishing for the rest of the day. So that was really probably one of my wife's worst days of her life. <laughs> um, because since then, I've been pursuing large fish to far corners of the earth, even buying a house near Nile so we can dive together all the time. So she probably curses that day, but for me it was one of the best days of my life. Oh, mate. We've all got one of those mates that our partner just loves to hate. It sounds like Niles, that guy. Oh, good. I calls him my fishing wife. <laughs> <She's> <laughs> That's a- very good. <laughs> oh, very good, mate. Well, it sounds like you've uh, speared with some cracking blokes over the years, mate, and, and learned a lot. Well, just a question there. You said you got started in your 40s, really got stuck back in in your 40s, you know, really got, got that taste for it again, mate. Um, how did you go, like, with your that learning progression, um, what sort of changes did you see in your dive times and um, and just your ability? I'm guessing that you sort of in your 20s or, or 30s or whatever, you're sort of um, – dived by yourself and you had your own sort of knowledge and then you got all this um, collective knowledge off these mentors and these great divers. What sort of differences did you see in your diving? Like, is there any one thing that really, you know, you can put your finger on? Yeah, so I did a couple of trips, um, probably 2006, 2007 with Audra and Creel. And at that point, um, you know, we were hugely far apart in terms of ability. Um, But I've always dived crayfish regularly when we could in South Africa. We used to have a long season. They've really cut our days down now but I dived a lot of crayfish so they kept me fit for diving um, I didn't do a lot of spear fishing but I went on two trips with him up to the eastern cape uh, to a place called Esther and um, that was where Tommy Borte actually got bitten by a great white um, a few years back on his hand um, but very good diving there in those days Adrian was just in a different league to me I couldn't uh, really keep up with him and then in 2016 I went with, with him and lived aboard on a boat for a week in Angola and we traveled from the south of Angola for nine days. We dived eight hours a day. Wow. And during those, those nine days, my diving went from being comfortable at 10, 15 meters to diving 25 meters. And I think the biggest single thing I learned, and I'll talk about that, was how to breathe up and how to get your breath right. Um, and then all the little tips of being more streamlined and, and getting your duck dive right and just, just being relaxed in the water and finding the fish. And I did shoot some really good fish on that trip. Mm -hmm. And I was just a little bit behind AK by the end of that trip, but I was catching up with him, I could feel it. And that was really the first time I realized, look, I could be a good spearer. I'd always been a competitive swimmer at school, one of the best swimmers, uh, provincial swimmer in that. So I knew I was a strong swimmer, pretty good hockey player, but I'd never really been a good spearer until that trip when I started shooting, you know, really good fish. And then the guys were saying, you you know, you, you're getting some nice fish. You should take this a bit more seriously. And I did. From that moment, I sort of started diving a lot more. Yeah, right, Ralph. Wow. That, that constant time in the water with someone who's a lot better than you, forcing you to really pick your act up and take notice, I think. Um... And I think more sitting around the, the campfire at night on the boat, we used to have a braai or barbecue on the boat every night, sitting at the back and, they would drink their rum and cokes and I'd drink my single malt whiskey. And then we'd share stories for like three or four hours. The guys would tell you things they'd learned, things, the mistakes they'd made, and some brilliant fish stories. And you just sort of really pick up the passion and the, the love of the sport from those sort of trips. Eh? Yeah, brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. I, I know exactly what you're talking about. I know often when Shrek and I are out, I sort of take him under my wing a little bit and just tell him stories about, about the fish he hasn't shot and – when I look at look at him and I see that look in his eye when he looks up at me, you know, and just that awe, and I just I just sort of think I'm really making a difference here, you know what I mean? And, and I'm sure that that's how you were with AK, and I hope Shrek yeah, listens pretty. to this actually. Now, mate, um, you've shot plenty of great fish. Um, is there one that really stands out in your mind that's uh, of a, of that you know milestone fish that you could that uh, really gets you excited? Yeah, I think I, I found it hard to, to find one particular fish. So I've actually got a list of three. And I've got a list of three fish that I've landed yeah. and then the three fish that I lost. <laughs> and I think the ones that you lose are actually the ones that haunt you the most. So I'll start with the, with the three fish that I landed. Um, I was fortunate enough in August 16 to go with Adrian Creel and with uh, Niall Cameron to Ascension Island, uh, where we were there to get our 100 kilo yellowfin tuna. Um, and it was quite fun because we met Rob Torelli and uh, um, a team of his guys from Australia. 
Adam Smith and uh, uh, Tim Nielsen. They were all there for Rob's 50th. So we had a good time with those guys. So, and then we had the team from New Zealand. We had Nat Davey. We had Rochelle Potter, his partner, and uh, another couple of, of New Zealanders. And there was a good healthy competition going between the three countries. It was a little bit like a Tri-Nations um, to see who could get the 100-kilogram yellowfin tuna. And at the end of the trip, um, Team South Africa, I think, was the only team that every guy got his 100-kilo yellowfin. So uh, maybe that makes up a bit for the, oh, <laughs> the last few Tri-Nations. But... Um, yeah, the, the Aussies did shoot some brilliant fish, and Rochelle shot the world record um, ladies' yellowfin tuna of 97 or 99 kilos, so that was great for her. So that was my first fish. I shot 115 kilo yellowfin on that trip. Um, the second fish was more recently. Um, I was in French Polynesia with Adrian Creel, Mark Jackson, and Jamie, and I shot the world record boha or twin spot snapper. Um, as anyone who's hunted those fish know, they're extremely clever fish, um, and they were all pretty deep there. I shot that one in 29 meters. Wow. Um, it was 12.7 kilos. It's been registered on the IUSA site, and uh, yeah, it, it smashed the previous record of 9.2, so it was nearly 45% bigger. So that was a big day for me, and we had a couple of whiskeys that night. Oh, so yeah. that was really and then I think the third most memorable fish is probably I uh, went with Rob Torelli to hunt bluefin tuna off the west coast of South, South Island mm -hmm. uh, in New Zealand. Um, and Graham Heapy from New Zealand was with us as well as a guide. And uh, the end of the first day, I stoned a 120 kilo southern bluefin tuna. Um, and I think the existing record is about 50 kilos. So 120 is a big southern yeah. bluefin. Uh, that was an amazing day. I just couldn't believe I stoned the fish. I kept having to to shake myself, and I got another gun and shot it again in the head just in case. <laughs> and that's one of my learnings I, I'll, I'll share with you later is that anybody out there, if you ever shoot a trophy fish, something that you know, you're going to remember your whole life, always kill shot the fish with a second gun. Mm -hmm. And if it's a world record, always make sure you loaded that second gun yourself because you're not allowed to have someone else load the gun for you. That was something I also learned uh, from, from Adrian years ago as well. So those were the three that uh, I landed. Um, the more painful part of the story is the three that got away. Um, and the first one was uh, I, I was in Principe Island in about June, July this year. And uh, my spear guns didn't arrive on the island. I traveled there for two days to get to this island and no spear guns and no dive bag. So I managed to go around the island and big borrow a pair of fins, a mask, um, a sort of second skin to keep the sun off me, an uh, old weight belt with one weight on it, and a small little spear gun of about one meter, Cressy double rubber. And luck would have it, my first day out there, I swim into a 200 kilogram black marlin. And the thing swims right up to me, and I shoot it just behind the eye, and I think, okay, I've stoned it. But unfortunately, the gun just wasn't strong enough to penetrate the brain. And it swam off, <laughs> towed me through the water like a jet ski for a while and then <laughs> disappeared into the blue water. It took me a few minutes to regain my composure, to say the least. <laughs> I bet it did. <laughs> and then the other one that, uh, that brought tears to my eyes, and uh, um, I'm not that proud of my behavior after losing it, was I was in Natal diving in Richards Bay. And I heard what we, we call cob or um, a cobble year here, it's, um, it's what you call a mulloway, I think, or a jewfish in Australia. And uh, I, I swam into one in a cave, uh, swam through the cave and out the other side, shot this fish point blank. It was somewhere between 35 and 40 kilograms, which is a really big one for this part of the world. Mm. So it's a, it's a fish of a lifetime. And the fish just rolled over dead. So I pulled it up to the surface. It was quite deep. It was about 25 meters. So I was out of air by that time. I went to the surface. And as I got to the fish and put my arms around it, it got a second lease on life and thrashed around, smashed me in the face with its head and got off the spear and escaped. And, uh, yeah, I know I had to lie down on the boat to recover from that one. I was so upset with myself. But what, what I did learn is if you ever shoot a really special fish, get a second gun in, or get, you know, if you're not a, it's not a record, get somebody else to put a second spear in it because there's nothing worse than hurting a fish and losing it. You know, it really makes you feel bad. And then I think the third one I remember that I lost was diving in French Polynesia. We went there to get big dog tooth tuna and wahoo. That's where you go. The Astral Islands with Gerard Grave as your guide is probably the place you're going to get a fish of the lifetime from either a doggy or, or a wahoo. And this particular wahoo, I swam down to the bottom, which is about 30 meters. And on my way back up, I saw these two bus wahoo sitting on the surface. You've actually seen the video. Yeah, Turbo. it's amazing. Yep. Um, 
And I snuck up on this fish. I'd been down for over two and a half minutes. So I was running out of air. And as I got that perfect shot through the tail part of the fish, nice angle on it, thing took off. I tr- grabbed onto the back of the floats as they went past. The fish dragged me through the water for a good two minutes before I couldn't hold on to the floats with a bungee anymore. I had to let go. Um, and by the time I got back to my floats, the sharks had demolished it. There was just a spear left. So, oh, yeah, um, very, very sad story. Yeah. <laughs> Happy one for the sharks. Sad for the diver. Outbreaking. Now, was that the guy, I think you mentioned to me, uh, the guide that um, that helped, uh, what was his name, Pengali, to get his two world records? So he's a very well-known guide, Gerard Grave. He's probably <clears throat> one of the most experienced guides in that part of the world. He's based uh, on Moria Island, I think, near Tahiti, and then he guides to all of the different islands in, in the French Polynesian chain. There's really no good fish in Tahiti. We dived a little bit around there in Moria. They're all gone. But the outer islands are outstanding. You know, it is hard to get there. Um, but uh, Gerard, uh, I know he told us the number of marlin he shot, but it's well in excess of 20 marlin that he shot and landed. He holds the world record for striped marlin and for Indo-Pacific blue marlin. I think that was 257 is one marlin. Um, and he's guarded, uh, you know, more big world records than probably anyone. I don't know, maybe Cameron Kirkconnell could be in that league. But he's a great guy, very passionate spearer. Mm-hmm. He has over 70 spear guns. <laughs> um, but what we also learned, <laughs> I know I it's amazing. Them, what we also learned from him is don't go on a trip like that under gun. Eh? We took our um, Rabbit Tech and Rob Allen 1.4 double rubbers. You can't shoot 100 kilogram dog tooth tuna with those. We shot at some 70 kilo um, GTs. The spears were bouncing out. Uh, and in that clean water, you really need a big blue water gun. So I bought two since then. I've got an Alemani um, Vela 130, which is that inverted roller. That gun will shoot. It will, that'll do the job on any fish. And then also a Rife Blue Water Express, one of those five rubber guns, you know. And I shot my southern bluefin tuna with that. So that was really a lesson to all four of us who went there. We thought we had guns that could shoot anything. But shooting a yellow tuna is different to shooting a dog tooth. You need a much stronger gun. Uh, you know, at your depth, uh, the water is very clean, and you need to be able to get that reach and punch through the fish. So, okay, um, <clears throat> those two blue water guns. You, you talked about um, sort of old-fashioned technology, stacking rubber after rubber, or and throwing a big spear on a sort of a, I'd probably say a wide platform gun. And you talked about probably the the latest in technology with a inverted roller. Of the two guns, what would you recommend, um, and why? And what are the what characteristics does that gun have to make it a superior gun? Yeah, so you know, it really comes down to to uh, there is no comparison between an Alemani Vela 150 to me and a Rife in terms of no recoil. So, so the the inverted roller guns are easier to load. Mm-hmm. Uh, you're only loading one rubber and one kicker band, and then all the bottom rubbers, so you can load the gun a lot faster. And, and when you pull the trigger, there's no recoil, virtually zero recoil. Yeah. So those Alemani guns are in a league of their own. You know, um, I've had two two Alemanis now, and, and they're both brilliantly engineered guns. You know, if you're a bit more, and they're three times the price of a Rife gun, probably at uh, least okay. double. Yep. A lot more expensive. Um, the Rife gun will do the job. Um, one thing you need to know on those Rife guns uh, is if you you need to put the wings on them. They come with a wing set. You buy it separately, and you put these two wings on 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 the actual gun. It allows the gun to track a lot more easily side to side, yep. and it also reduces recoil, so you don't end up spraining your wrist. A lot of guys sprain their wrists on those mid-handle guns. Even putting your left hand on the back of the butt and your right hand on the middle of you know, where the mid-handle um, trigger thing is, when you pull the trigger, you get quite a lot of kick. Okay. But it does the job. So, And it's a very robust, simple gun, the, the Rife Blue Water gun. So I could recommend both. But if you, you, know, if you can afford an Alemani or if you can uh, build your own inverted roller, some of the guys in Safeco are building really good inverted roller guns here. Yeah, I know um, Chris Coates is making that Mamba. Uh, and Spear uh, in, in, is also making some inverted roller guns, which are really great. So I, I believe in that technology. It's it's so 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 powerful and and easy to load. It just makes your life a lot easier. No recoil, even compared to a conventional roller, it's uh, significantly less recoil. Well, you've got me sold. I, I've actually been lucky enough to use a Manny Sub inverted roller, and uh, I could not understand why anybody would still be using. Uh, 
a stacked up five or six rubber um, conventional gun. They were, it was just absolutely beautiful to use. It tracked like a, a 1.2 um, standard, standard uh, double rubber gun, but it shot like nothing else. It was absolutely phenomenal. All right, well, that's our, uh, that's our memorable fish. You've got a few there. Uh, actually, if I could go back, backtrack, the Boha snapper. Now, you mentioned to me earlier um, off air, I believe, that they're quite a difficult fish and a tricky fish. Um, and we're about to go into hunting technique. And I would just w- I'd like to know a little bit more about that species as a whole um, before we go to your principal hunting technique. If we just talk about uh, these Boha snapper and what makes them so difficult to shoot and your tips for actually landing one of these fish. Um, yeah, so I hadn't shot a lot of bohas in the past, but I had watched a few videos on how to hunt them. There's, there's quite a good um, a video that was called Maputo Madness, done by African Spearfishing Diaries. And in there, Jeremy uh, from Dive Factory, from Rob Allen, who's actually the, the, the 50% partner with Rob Allen in his business, spends a, a good 10 minutes uh, hunting some boa snappers and giving tips on that video. Mm-hmm. And he says and a very important thing with those fish is to try not to let them see you if possible um, and hide behind a piece of reef, reef structure grunt as soon as you see them pull the trigger and shoot the fish. Okay. Um, unfortunately, I was diving in 30 meters of water there. So I, I, can, I can shoot fish at 30 meters, but I don't tend to hide behind pieces of structure for a long time uh, <laughs> because I want to get That's back to the surface. I'm not Yaka Blignort yet. So, um, but I did that fish. I saw it from above and there was quite a lot of current. So I swam down uh, and kind of got in its blind spot and it didn't see me until it, it kind of turned its head. And as it turned, I, I was able to take the shot and quite a long shot and I shot it and landed it. But they're very strong fish as well. It, uh, it, it t- tore off around the reef and went around a bommy and, uh, and then as I pulled it up, the sharks came for it. So I'd say, the main thing is if you're not too deep is to try and get behind a bit of structure, use that grunting. Um, and then when they come, they're very inquisitive. Uh, as soon as you see them, shoot them. Because when they see what you are, they disappear quickly. And that one was the third one I'd taken a shot at. Uh, the first two I didn't hit just because I couldn't get close to the fish. But I enjoy that. I like snappers that are tricky fish to hunt. Um, uh, and I was really, really excited when I managed to land that. Mark also managed to get a pretty big one, over 12 kilos while we were there as well. Um, and he gave me a few of those tips uh, that I was able to use in, in hunting down those boha. Yeah, right. Wow. So uh, don't be seen and uh, and don't don't give them any sort of chance to get away. You've sort of got to pull that trigger as quick as possible. And sort of. Yeah, I think you have to take your shot as soon as you get it. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Eh? Wow. <laughs> Guys, exciting news about 99 tips to get better at spearfishing. Shrek and I are running a crowdfunding campaign to get the book off the ground, get it printed up, bound in beautiful hardcovers and sent out to you. So basically, this gives you an opportunity to pre-purchase the book or pledge some money to help us get it going because it's been quite a difficult process to get it printed. Now, this basically is going to start on the 10th of March and there'll be a bunch of different pledges uh, for you to pledge to different amounts of money. So basically, at the bottom end, it starts for $5. Uh, you can get a shout-out on the show and your name in the book. Uh, for $12, you can get uh, um, an ebook version of 99 Tips with all those fantastic photographs from some of the best um, spearfishing photographers in the world. It looks absolutely amazing, um, all edited up beautifully by Sky Bailey, the um, graphic designer at um, Spearing Magazine. It will look, it does look fantastic. Um, and on top of that, uh, there's uh, pledges for t-shirts. Uh, there's also a little bit more. Uh, you can come on the show. Uh, another pledge is uh, for advertising. There's advertising spots in the book. So if you are a uh, spearfishing related business or any business, uh, you can uh, advertise in the book and pledge there. Those places are limited, uh, so you better be quick for those if you're interested. So that's going to be run on kickstarter.com. I reckon I'll keep you posted closer to the date, but in any way that you can help would be a would, would mean a lot to us anyway. So um, keep an eye out for that. All right, back to the show. All right, um, hunting technique. 
Chris, what have you... Um, I don't know if you're familiar with this part of the show. I might have sprung this one on you, but uh, it's fairly new. So basically, we, we ask you about a, prefer, a hunting technique that you've sort of um, used in your spear fishing that you're having great success with, or maybe even um, a species of fish that you're doing something different with that you're having great success with. So I think I'll probably choose the Spanish mackerel. I always find that we call that a cooter in South Africa. Mm. Um, it's a king mackerel here. We get the, the queen mackerel, which we call a snook in Natal, and, 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 a, and, a, and a king mackerel, which is the cooter. Mm. Uh, we always dive with flashes. We're diving in about 20 to 30 meters of water, and you wait until you can see the mackerel come up to have a look at your flasher. You then swim down onto them. They always start swimming away from you. And you chase after the fish for a few meters, and then you veer off either to the right or the left. And for some reason, they cannot help themselves. They always take a turn and swim with you in the same direction and present their bodies to you for a shot. Yeah. It works like a charm, and then you just shoot the fish at a nice angle through it, and you, you get a very high success rate in landing them. You know, when someone first explained that to me, I, I didn't think it would work. It sounded a bit far-fetched, but yeah. I've done it. 20 or 30 times and every time the fish has turned with me and I've taken the shot um, and it's worked well. Um, I've hunted a lot of yellowfin tuna. I've probably shot sure, maybe more than 15 yellowfin tuna over 80 kilos. Um, here in Cape Town we get good ones but it's very hard to get them over 100 kilos. But here we, 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 we trawl with a boat until we get a strike or we get good marks on the sounder or unless we can find a target like a trawler or a longliner. We then start chumming it up, get the fish under the boat so we can see the marking on the sounder. We, we then hop in and, and, and just go and pick a piece of chum. So I, I watch the fish see how it's feeding and then I, see, I let them eat two or three pieces of chum and then I wait till there's one piece of chum left and I swim down and I just aim at that piece of chum. As the yellowfin tuna arrives, I shoot about a foot in front of its head. And generally, you'll connect with the middle of the body of the fish that are traveling so fast. Yeah. Um, and that's worked really well for us here. In Ascension, we used a completely different strategy. We got in the water with a bag of chum. One guy just chummed all day. One guy kept the sharks away. And one guy waited for the fish to arrive. And we'd sit in that water for three hours. Eventually, one of those 100 kilo the elephant would arrive and all the other fish would disappear. And then we'd take about 20 minutes to get him up from 30 meters, 20 meters, 10 meters. And then you're just dropping one side in down at a time. And eventually he comes up close and you just dip down and take that shot. And that worked very well working as a team like that. There were a lot of sharks in Ascension though that was making it difficult to land fish. And one of the things, I mean, maybe it's a good rule, but they didn't tell us before. And was when you go to Ascension, they say you're only allowed to shoot one elephant over 100 kilos. And if you're there for nine days, it's a long way to go for one fish. Um, I think Colin should probably be a bit more upfront about that when he tells you and you're going that you only get one fish. I think that's a pretty good rule, but they should maybe make it one fish per week that you're there. Yeah. So if you're there for two weeks, you can get two maybe. Um, there are other good fish to shoot there. Amberjack, we shot some big amberjack there, about 25 kilo. We shot uh, some barracuda and we shot, uh, well, Nile got a 25 kilo wahoo. There's some big wahoo there yeah. too, but... Yeah, some good hunting uh, techniques we picked up on, on both Ascension and Cape Town. Yeah, that's a beauty. That um, It's quite interesting, that teamwork, to bring those big fish up off the bottom. That must seem like an absolute eternity. Do you find that you lose some? Do you find that you're getting a high success rate of getting when that big fish shows up, getting it up within um, a sort of a shooting range? So... <laughs> The Afrikaans have a very good word. They call it book course. I don't know what, I'm not a great Afrikaans speaker, but it means like buck fever. Yep. So once you've got over that buck fever, if you haven't shot a lot of fish over 100 kilos, when one swims near you um, the first time, your hands start shaking and the adrenaline spikes. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> so, so the first day we were there, um, we saw quite a lot of yellowfin, but smallish ones, and then we saw this big one. Um, and I shot one. Unfortunately, we hadn't pulled our flash up, and as I, sh I got a very good shot into it, but it swam away and cut the line off, cut the um, spear line off on one of the metal flashes, wow. and that was quite sad. Um, but I think really to, to prepare yourself mentally to be patient enough. Adrian's got incredible patience, so he would sort of signal us of, both, both um, Niall and myself, when it was time to take that dive, because it's very hard when you see a 110 kilo, 120 kilo tuna, 20 meters, not to dive down onto it. But it's the wrong thing to do. You need to wait and wait until the, till you've got an absolute sitter of a shot, and then you're not going to harm the fish. You're not going to, you're going to land that fish as long as the sharks don't get it. 
Um, and we had to shepherd the sharks quite a bit. I was diving down a lot to keep the sharks off um, uh, Adrian's fish. And I don't know if you saw a picture of Niall's fish, but his was 100 kilos after about 30 kilos of uh, tuna meat had been bitten <laughs> off the <by> sharks. <laughs> so yeah, it was right. a big one. So how close to the surface are these tuna coming? Like you said, they're coming from I'd the say coast. most yellowfin tuna you shoot in the top 10 meters of water. You know, I've shot some at 20 and 30 meters, but most of them are, you, you've got to wait for them to come up and you've got to let them get calm and be used to you. And then you just take your chance when they go for that piece of chum. Right. So even with a, like, a fairly modest um, breath hold and depth, as long as you stay calm, you probably and stick to the game plan. You're probably a good chance of, of getting a spear in one of those fish. Yeah, so I mean, in, in some ways that's so true. It's it's probably easier to shoot a big yellowfin than than it is to shoot a 12 kilo boa snapper. You know, you first of all you have to dive to 30 meters to find the fish. You know, and, and I find that, but it's still there's nothing like shooting one of those big yellowfin uh, and seeing them take off with your float, and the float disappears yeah. down to 20 meters, and there's all and and my fish a 115 kilo one towed us three kilometers, all three of us hanging onto the float. So that was amazing, and then doing the kill shot when we got it up and. Um, it was a really great experience and real teamwork. So those big fish, you need to work as a team to get them. Yeah, wow. Uh, it does sound exciting. Um, I am still haven't even got the 30, 30 kilo club yet, so uh, we'll just leave 100 kilos for now. We'll get you over to Cape Town. We'll take you out for tuna here. We've got very good tuna grounds off Cape Town. So the month of November and the month of May are generally when the big fish are here. Yep. Um, and uh, I've, I've got a friend who's a tuna skipper takes our charters and he's a good spearer as well. So we, we generally get fish. It's a it's a bit of hit and miss tuna. You know, you go one time, you get nothing. You go the next time, you get one. And then you go the fifth time and you get three. So it's, uh, you know, it's you've got to keep going to get the good fish. Yeah, wow. No, that sounds exciting. I, well, I did speak to Shrek about that. So uh, that is definitely on the cards. All right, uh, toughest situation. You, you've been on the water a bit, mate. What's what's the uh, what's a near miss or, or a tough situation you've had to deal with um, when, in your days on the water? I think you know, for for, for, for me, there are probably two main dangers in diving. One is sharks, uh, particularly here in the Cape and Strait by places we dive. There are a lot of great whites, and the other one is is running out of oxygen, shallow water blackout. So I did a free diving course with Trevor Hutton, who holds the world record for shooting a fish, I think, at 63 meters. Oh, wow. He's a South African diver. Um, he's been a competitive free diver in the world, but he's, he's shot fish deeper than anyone else. And he's been trying to shoot a fish at 70 meters for a couple of years now, and I believe he will do it. So I did a three-day course with him here in Cape Town just before I went on my sabbatical. Um, and uh, I learned a lot about free diving from him and, and the dangers and uh, just some of the safety aspects. But for me, the two scary stories was, first of all, in Cannon Rocks, this is a shark story. Niall and I had probably the fishiest day we'd ever had. I don't know, sometimes you get to a hot spot and the fish are just on. Clean water and there are big fish everywhere. And we were diving just off his house um, in Bockness on a reef called Raggy Reef. And uh, we actually anchored the boat. We had a friend on, on, to on top as top man, but, but we were diving, both Niall and I, and we had a youngster who was first time sort of out spearfishing. And after my first dive, I saw a very nice white mussel cracker, probably in the 15 kilo range. It didn't come close enough to shoot. The water was very, very clean. But the raggy raggies, which you call gray nurse sharks, were misbehaving. I could just tell that all their body language was wrong. They were buzzing us. They were bumping they were all over us. And both Niall and I came up and said, gee, the raggies, there's something strange going on here. And he said, yeah, have you seen some of the fish there? I said, yeah, it's amazing. I've never seen it this fishy before. <laughs> That's obviously why the sharks were so excited. Anyway, my second dive down, a um, yellowtail kingfish of somewhere between 25 and 30 kilograms, which for South Africa is massive, swam past. And I put a good spear shot into the middle of the fish, came up, it stripped my whole reel. And it was before I was diving with a belt reel, so I didn't have anything to clip onto. I handed my gun to Niall to hold, took his gun, swam down the, the, the spear, the, the reel line, and put a kill shot into the fish, actually just as I was about to come off the spear, because it had been fighting hard and wedged itself under a rock. Um, as I shot the fish, um, I got muzzle wrap on the end of his gun. Oh and uh, oh so I'm pulling this this yellowtail and I can see all the raggies around getting very excited and as I get towards the surface probably about a three three and a half meter raggy comes and grabs a hold of this um this yellowtail I, I'm maybe two meters from this because I'm 
I can't get away from it. I haven't got a belt reel to clip on to get away. I'm either going to lose Niles' gun and the fish or I'm going to... So I hang on and swim back to the boat as fast as I can, pulling this three-meter great white. All the other... Uh, three, sorry, three-meter raggy. All the other raggies are trying to get in the action. Eventually, I get back on the boat, pull the spear in, and I, and I got the head, and I've got a good photo of it. The head was 11 kilograms. <laughs> Is that right? But... In all the chaos that ensued, Niall managed to drop my spear gun with a um, GoPro on it, and we had to do a few drift darts. And again, we found the gun, but you know, the raggies were so um, aggressive. One came so hot, fast at me and so hot, I tried to push it away with a spear gun, and, and the spear went right into the middle of the shark. So there again, I'm attached to a sort of two, three meter <laughs> raggy that's going ballistic, and I'm holding on to the end of the spear gun, not sure what to do. So I just pulled the trigger, again, muzzle wrap. So this time I was a bit wiser. I gave the gun to a friend of mine on the boat and said, won't you hold this? <laughs> this is, is raggy thrashing around below. <laughs> he still thanks me for that. His name's Alex Hopkins, and uh, shout out to him. He, he, he did a good job. He got my spear gun back and the spear, and a very angry raggy swam off. But that was one of the days when, and I think the lesson for me there is when sharks are behaving very strangely, it's probably a good idea to get out of the water. Um, it's hard when it's that fishy, but it's the right thing to do. The sharks weren't behaving normally. I've dived in that spot a hundred times. I've never seen them behave like that. They were looking to take bites out of people that day. Yeah, that's very interesting because the the raggy, the grey nurse has a has that reputation of being quite calm. But every now and then, you talk to a, a, a spiro somewhere in the world that says it's just not the case. There's days that the the uh, the grey nurse or the ragtooth shark are quite aggressive. Yeah, so the rule of thumb for us is if they're coming up off the bottom and going for you on the surface, then you know there's a problem. It's time to move or, or take action. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so, well, I remember that. Um, but, uh, yeah, if that, so that's a good rule of thumb. As soon as they start coming off the bottom and coming up at you aggressively, you know that there's something different that day and then you should do something. Um, but but uh, more guys, a couple of guys have been bitten here by raggies. Eh? Mark Jackson had his fins bitten really badly. His fins are patched up with epoxy everywhere for all the bite marks in his fins. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <wow. laughs> so he, he doesn't like raggies a lot. Eh? Um, yeah, and then maybe to move on to my second story about running out of air. I was diving in Panama, and I did have a belt reel because um, I'd learned my lesson that it's a good idea with a real gun to always have a belt reel that you can clip on. It just gives you more distance to get away from a problem, particularly if you're running out of air. Um, and I was diving in pretty deep, uh, pretty dirty water in about 28 meters. I swam down to the bottom and a big shoal of Kubera snappers swam past me. So I shot one of about 15 kilos. Um, and the, the incredibly strong fish, I didn't stone it. I just got a good solid middle of the fish shot. And the thing pulled me so hard. And then I realized my reel had jammed up a bit from all the pulling. So I clipped my belt reel on and started swimming for the surface as hard as I could. Um, and I did get back to the surface, but I, I was almost out of air. And I, I, I've never been that close to running out of oxygen. I, I didn't get a samba or any of those things. But I looked at my belt reel and I had one wrap of line left on there. Wow. Um, I could have dropped my belt reel. It's one of those quick release drop drop uh, things. But uh, in the in the moment, I wanted to land that fish. But no fish is worth losing your life over. So you know, get rid of your gun, get rid of your belt reel um, if you have to. Um, use your knife if you have to. Uh, but uh, I, I sort of made a rule for myself on that trip after that that I wouldn't shoot a big kubera in anything deeper than 15 meters because they're so strong. Uh, you really need to make sure you can get to the surface and then pull them out of whatever cave they hold up in. Um, or if you're lucky enough to keep it off the bottom or kill it, um, you'll you'll be fine. But that for me was a, was a good lesson. I've, I've, that was the closest call I've had to to a shallow water blackout. Yeah, right. The, now the the belt reel you said was a quick release. Is there a a belt reel that you'd recommend that you? That you use that's a rob allen belt reel so it's their new one it's very good it's got a piece of elastic and slides around the back and you can release it pretty quickly so you know the other good thing about that belt reel is you can take it off and clip it onto a float if you've shot a marlin or something while you you know you're yellowtail fishing so to me it's, it's really great to be able to quickly clip on a float line if you've shot something significant uh, and you don't want to you know you quite hang on to the fish so, yeah, that Rob Allen one is first class. I've tried a few different ones. That one's excellent. Yeah, excellent. That's good advice. G'day, guys. In today's episode, we have talked about lots of different spearfishing equipment. Chances are you can get your hands on most of it at spearfishing.com.au. They've got competitive prices and an awesome hassle-free returns policy. 
They uh, have $15 flat rate shipping Australia wide. Chances are, if you order that equipment today, it will be at your doorstep tomorrow. And you can even save a little bit more money by using the code NoobSparrow at checkout. That'll save you a further $20 on every purchase over $200. It also helps support the Noob Spiro podcast. So head over to spearfishing.com.au and save some money on some gear. Thanks for listening, guys. Trek, my diving of late has improved out of sight. And do you know why? No. Because I, pick, I picked myself up a copy of 99 Tips to Get Better at Spearfishing. Wow. Is that why your hunting techniques have improved as well? Not just my hunting techniques, my free diving, my breath hold, and my awareness. Wow. You really are a Spiro 2.0. Yes, that's right. I really am a Spiro 2.0, as per Chapter 7, I believe. Spiro 2.0. <laughs> and it's all thanks to... 99 Tips to Get Better at Spearfishing. Now, where did I find it, you ask? On (laughs) Amazon.com. That's right. So get on Amazon.com and check it out. But in all seriousness, it's a great book compiled from over 40 contributors. Absolutely fantastic. And you will improve your diving, guaranteed, if you read that book. There's tips there from legends like Rob Allen and Chris Coates out of South Africa to Simon Tripp and uh, some other Aussie guys. Lots of Aussie guys. Lots of Aussie guys. I think there might even be some New Zealanders in there. Dwayne Herbert. Dwayne Herbert. Darren Shields. We've got Cameron Kirkconnell. A couple from myself there. I put myself in that same league. Yeah, so look, a Turbo's ones, we, we glazed over them. <laughs> and uh, look, I took, I often took 10 of Turbo's tips and punched them into one so you get good value for money. Find it cheap on Amazon.com. 99 tips to get better at spearfishing. All right. Uh, yeah, a scary moment. So, and I think you're the first one that's ever had, encountered a scary uh, grey nurse shark on the show or, or a raggy tooth shark. So um, that, that's a first for the show. Now, our next, uh, and we haven't even discussed this yet because uh, because of my professionalism, um, I was late to the interview, as you know, but our next uh, section of the show is uh, our Veterans Vault, Chris, and I have no idea what you want to talk about, so uh, oh, I'm very keen to learn something new. Okay, great. So I wrote down probably 10 points here um, that, that, that I think are top tips for divers. Um, and, and hopefully th- these will be things that I've learned over the years that I can, can share share with your listeners. The first one is simplify. So less is more. You had uh, one of your guests on your show say, don't go diving dressed up like a Christmas tree. Yeah. Every time I've tried to, <laughs> tried to take too much stuff, it's just a, a hassle. You want to have the bare minimum. So you want, you know, you, you want one knife. You want uh, keep it as simple as possible. I'm wearing a lycra suit over your wetsuit to just a hassle. So keep it simple. Um, uh, probably the most valuable single piece of, of advice anyone's given me was Trevor Hutton's breathe up advice for free diving. And actually Adrian shared that with me because he had done a Trevor Hutton course a few years back. So it's quite a simple technique. And the way you do it is you come back to the surface after your dive. You spend 30 seconds getting rid of carbon dioxide. So you're swimming slowly along the surface, kicking, moving your arms a bit, just working that CO2 out of your system. You can do it for longer if you need to, but this is sort of a one minute 30 recharge cycle. So the first 30 seconds, get rid of CO2. The next 30 seconds, you lie dead still on the surface and you breathe deeply and slowly and you get your heart rate down and you're breathing and reload all your oxygen and get yourself in a completely calm state. And then the next 30 seconds, you do three breathe-ups. And so what you do is you take three very deep breaths. And then the third breath, you hold your breath for five seconds. And then you breathe out. You take three deep breaths again, hold your breath for five seconds, breathe out. And then you take your last three deep breaths, hold your breath and dive. And you will find that you can go from comfortably diving at 15 meters to reasonably comfortably diving at 25 meters. That's what it did for me. So I... I was amazed that no one had ever taught that. And, and some guys don't believe that works. I've discussed it with various different divers. But for me, that makes a significant difference. And I think like everything in life, if you get a good habit going, um, it's safe. Uh, it's a, and, 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 and it really helped me to start shooting fish at below 25 meters. So for, for me, that's a good one. Wow, that's a great piece of advice. Well, uh, we, we'll... We'll get that into the show notes and put that into a show blog and share that with our uh, with our listeners because it's sort of something you sort of need to, to see written down and to, to appreciate. That's a great piece of advice. All right, what's our third our third uh, tip for Spiros to improve? Okay, so I think it's important to get your buoyancy right. So as you start diving deeper, and the first um, 
you know, zero to 15 meters, you dive with, call it five weights. As soon as you're going deeper than 15 meters, it's always a good idea to drop a weight off your weight belt. Where you should be neutrally buoyant is halfway down in your dive. So if you're diving 20 meters at 10 meters, you should be neutrally buoyant. Uh, it's a bit of a hassle sometimes to put weights on and take them off, but you'll be significantly less tired and safer if you if you drop a weight for deeper diving. So when we're diving in the shallows and 10 meters, I'll put that extra weight back on. As soon as we go out deeper and we're back in 25, I'll put another weight, take a weight off. And I think that's an important discipline to have. Um, so you get your buoyancy right because it makes a huge difference um, to your bottom time and to your how tired you are going up and down. Um, Maybe another couple of uh, lessons that I've learned uh, around, uh, you know, I mentioned the one and that's a critical one. If you shoot a trophy fish, make sure you kill, shot the fish. I've mentioned that before, but that's a really, I would have kept a couple of really special fish if I'd known that. Um, and then it's yep. a good discipline to have. Um, and then use a belt reel. You know, if you're using a, a, a real gun, get a belt reel. It's, it gives you an additional option. If you've got a muzzle wrap or something, I've lost a couple of big fish because of muzzle wrap. Um, and these new Rob Allen um, muzzles are really great for, for not muzzle wrapping. Rollers are less likely to muzzle wrap as well. I mainly dive with a 1.1 meter um, Rabbit Tech uh, roller gun with a Rob Allen roller head. I know Rabbi Tech's designing a new roller head, which looks really amazing, but I like the Rob Allen one. Um, and yeah, I've shot some very good fish with that 1.1 meter gun. Very simple, very strong, low recoil. That that uh, 1.1 gun, just to give listeners an, of an, a bit of an idea of what you use that gun for. So, so you'd, you'd hunt sort of smaller fish in the shallows up to what sort of size fish do you think that uh, that gun comfortably handles? I think that shoots anything up to 25 kilos. Eh? So I've shot even up to 30 kilos maybe. Um, I've actually shot a, a yellowfin tuna, but they're quite soft fish with those guns as well. Uh, so I'd say as soon as you're starting to shoot a GT of over 20 kilos, you need a stronger gun which can go through the heads, you know. Yeah. Um, so then I'd move up to a 1.3 double rubber with maybe a kicker band yeah. um, or, or – I've found, so some of my friends have completely different experiences. I believe roller guns work better up to 1.1 meters. Mm -hmm. And then above that, I go to twin rubbers or, or um, for my 1.3s and 1.4s. That's just my preference. Yeah. Uh, Mark Jackson dives with a 1.3 roller and he finds it fantastic. And my Vela Alemani is a 1.3, but I just haven't had as much luck with the longer rollers. So I've tended to stick to my 1.1 and I can put a kicker band on my 1.1 one roller to give it a bit more punch then it'll punch through just about anything yeah okay and then at bigger guns you you go up to those inverted rollers that you, you spoke about earlier so the Vela's are 130 and then i've got a, a rabbi tech um 1.4 double rubber as well that i'll use for blue water hunting sometimes um that, that's a good sort of wahoo gun and, and we use that up in the tail when we're diving there simple to reload shoot a lot of um, spanish mackerel and queen mackerel where you need to reload quickly as well it's yeah. simple and easy to use and again, I put a Rob Allen uh, muzzle on the end of that because I just like them. They don't muzzle wrap as often. Okay. All right. So uh, what are we up to? I think we're up to sixth point for Veterans Vault. Yeah. One, one good uh, piece of advice someone gave me is if you get a new mask, and I'm sure most divers have had this, uh, they tend to, to fog up. But even your, your you know, so, so when you get a new mask, spend 10 minutes with a with a, a glob of toothpaste on, on your finger, rubbing it into the inside of your mask, both lenses. Spend 10 minutes per lens. And then repeat that sort of every six months and you tend to get a lot less misting up on your thing. You know, for new divers, that's often seen to be the problem. That, that, you know, you need your mask never to mist up, especially when you're diving deep. You want to be as comfortable in the water as possible. I found that a useful thing that I learned from Louis Hutton at uh, Rabitech. Um, and then the other one is carry decongestants with you when you're out to sea. I often find I'm having to give my decongestants to all the other divers because they don't carry their own. But that's one thing that can really ruin your day out. If you're out there and you start having problems with your sinuses or your ears, have, have a sinu tab or a, we use a thing called Demazin here, a pill. You take one of those, it sorts your congestion out and you can carry on diving comfortably. Um, it's a good thing to have a, a little medicine box on, in your dive bag with a headache pill and uh, maybe a seasick pill in case you've got someone on the boat to get seasick. Just a little, you know, couple of things that you can, can have. If, if uh, It can ruin your day out if everyone else is diving and you're sitting on the surface. Yeah, it's the, it's the worst. And then somebody tells you to start snorting salt water, which is not, not that easy to do or comfortable. 
it's not for me, no. And then the last tip that um, Trevor Hutton told me, which is, is is always carry two weight belts on a boat. I don't often do this. I, I'm trying to do it more and more. He says the reason is especially, this is for deep diving. So I'm saying 30 meter plus diving, have two weight belts on the boat because it'll remove your reticence to drop your weight belt. And Trevor said to me, if you ever think you should drop your weight belt, drop it. He says, because by the time you've thought about it and, and, and said, nah, I don't want to drop it, it's too late. So he showed me a couple of videos of him blacking out and he dropped his weight belt on both occasions. It saved his life. Wow. Um, yeah, so not a bad idea. Just have a spare weight belt on the boat. If you're diving really deep and you think you've got in trouble, drop your weight belt. You, you know, the weight belt's not worth your life and then you can use your, your other weight belt on the boat. So it was quite a good tip. Uh, I think I read it in Terry Moss's book to have a second weight belt. It removes that mental block that you don't want to drop your weight belt because you know you're not going to be diving for the rest of the day. Yeah, no, it's, it's actually a re- it's a really good piece of advice because I, I think I found myself in the same situation. You, you you know in the back of your mind you drop that weight belt, you're not diving for the rest of the day. That's it. That's uh, you're going boaty. So I, I think that's that removes that issue mentally. It's great advice. So even if you just have one spare belt for everyone on the boat, so that, you know the guys know if there's a problem, drop that belt. Eh? We had a young guy die here in, in January in South Africa in the Eastern Cape. They think he shot, shot a big yellow tail, didn't come up. Um, and, and uh, you know, maybe if he dropped his weight belt, at least he would have floated to the surface out of Farnham and you can resusc- resuscitate the, the guy. Yeah. All right. Wow. Well, yeah. What else have you got for us in your veterans vault? I'm loving this. You're very okay, organized. You, you're one of the first guys that's actually going to his notes. And uh, it's the, you're the first guest that we've never sent our show notes to, so you don't know what's coming except for what you've heard on the show, and you've actually got notes. I can't believe it. It's amazing. Quite a good one on roller guns is to detension your roller rubbers every time you, you finish diving. So don't leave your roller gun loaded up um, with your rubbers stretched because they do stretch and they perish. And I probably lost that big cob because I hadn't been, uh, you know, removing my roller rubber. I just didn't think about it. Yeah. But, you know, every night take take your rubber off your off the back of your reel and, and, and let it be in a state of no tension. Because otherwise, your, your rubbers will stretch and you just haven't got the power in there. So that's a good tip as well with roller guns to always remove that tension at the end of the day. Yep. And, and it's, it's, sitting it's, covered. there's a lot of opinions on this. What is your favorite rubber to run on your roller guns? Uh, probably a 16 or 18 millimeter um, rubber. Uh, it depends on, on, on the gun configuration. But I'd say probably a 16 millimeter rubber is the right rubber um, that, that just gives you the, the right stretch and the right um, power. I wouldn't go as high as a 20 mil rubber, but an 18 is fine as well. I've seen that working well too. Yep. Okay. And any any brand preference? Because I'm, there's a lot of difference in, in rubber these days. Um, I yeah, Rob Allen rubbers are good. Yeah. Um, a good way to tell good rubber is how small the hole is uh, in the middle of the rubber. Okay. If it's got a really small hole, there's a lot more rubber in there, which is a good sign. And it's really hard to get your, your wishbones in there. But um, yeah, I bought some, some uh, rubber's not often that, that branded, but the Rob Allen rubber's good. Rabbitech's got a new sort of treacle colored rubber that's mm-hmm. fantastic. He's just launched it. Um, so yeah, spend a bit of time on the rubber and learning what works for you and, and, and spend a bit more money on good rubber, yeah. uh, because you know, they last a year or so and, and, and they can make the difference between landing and, and losing a big fish. Yeah, absolutely. Couldn't agree more. I, I, I did, uh, I made the mistake of taking an 18 mil 1.1 roller gun, uh, to the reef, which initially was great going from a 1.2, um, double rubber gun. And then, uh, but what I found was just the the loading of those 18 mil bands on those big guns all day when you're just shooting reef fish. So you, you're loading constantly all day. It was very fatiguing. And then I took uh, Manny Bobber's advice and went down to a uh, a one meter 16 mil uh, roller gun. And I found that thing so much easier to load. It tracked well. It was just just the short the that little reduction in 100 mil of length made such a difference tracking that gun around and um, loading it all day it's uh it's become my go-to gun i think and i'll, I'll probably only use that uh, 18 mil 1.1 for sort of out wide with bigger fish but um yeah i wouldn't go back to it now for reef stuff no way all right chris uh mate have you got anything else to add to veterans vault no i think that's that covers all of the points eh? yeah that's brilliant mate i'm just going to go back over those so uh so Chris's tips in his Veterans Vault, simplify it, less is more. 
uh, breathe up. We're going to share those details of, of how he breathes up to get uh, that that increased bottom time and depth. Uh, it's very important. Uh, buoyancy, uh, Chris said to make sure that you're buoyant about halfway through the depth of your dive. It's very important for fatigue and safety. Uh, trophy fish, make sure you get that kill shot in the fish. Uh, as Chris said, he's lost a couple of great fish um, and you know you, you don't get that chance back often. Uh, belt reel, uh, make sure you use a belt reel for safety and uh, make sure it's a quick release belt reel. Uh, it's very, very important. New masks, make sure you defog those new masks and do, do that sort of servicing on them every six months or so to, to make sure they don't fog up on you. There's nothing worse. Uh, seven, we had decongestants. Make sure you carry those decongestants uh, on trips, particularly um, on longer trips. I mean, there's nothing worse than, you know, maybe get a bit of a flu or whatever, a bit of a cold, head cold and you can't dive um, because of your sinuses. Two weight belts on the boat so that you, you're not loath to uh, drop your weight belt in an emergency. And roller guns, make sure you keep the tension off those rubbers when they're not in use. I think that's great advice there for any new diver, Chris. So that's a lot of ground covered. <laughs> I was furiously taking notes, mate. Usually Shrek's asking questions and I'm taking notes and I hand him the notebook. And it, I, I really, I do. I'll make him sound good. I'm going to claim it. So, um, yeah, that's, that's a lot of great advice there, Chris. All right, the f- funniest moment, mate. You dive around uh, Nile a bit. I'm sure you've got something funny to say. About uh, Niall or any other other mates over there? Well, Niall was involved, but he wasn't the main protagonist of this story. (laughs) We were dying in in Angola, and it was uh, Mark Jackson. And Mark uh, is is the same age as me. He's 47. And his dive partner is a young chap called Jamie. He's 26. And and Mark's been sort of mentoring him and getting him up. He won the Eastern Cape Champs last year, um, Jamie. So he's a very good diver. And he's got a good sense of humor. And the two of them are like an old married couple. They're always bickering on the boat, taking the piss out of each other. And they're just really fun guys to dive with because they get good, healthy competition going. And and uh, and, and the other really look after each other as well. So just really decent blokes. But Mark has got a photographic memory for fish weights. So if you ask him 10 years ago when you went to buses, what fish did you shoot? He can tell you, I shot a 58 kilogram GT, and he'll tell you what everyone else shot as well. He just has like a, a, a idiot savant ability to know what, what fish were shot on a day and what they weighed. Yep. So he, he prides himself on being able to look at a fish and tell you what weight it is. Anyway, we get back and we're weighing all our yellow bellies or what uh, some people call dusky grouper. And you get really big ones in um, in Angola. I've shot three over 25 kilos there. Um, my biggest is 26, I think. And Mark shot one of 27 and a half kilos this day. And Jamie shot one, um, what we thought was 26 kilos. But what happened is while Mark wasn't looking, Jamie took his 23 kilogram fish and shoved three weights down its throat <laughs> into his belly. <laughs> so, so when we weighing the fish, Mark looked at it. He said, yeah, that's about a 23 kilo one if mine's 27. And then we hang it up on the scale and we weigh it. And it's 26 kilos. And he looks at this fish and he looks at Jane, he looks at me and he says, scale can't be right. It, it, it's definitely not right. There's something wrong here. And Jamie and I are trying not to piss ourselves. We just, you know, it's just, we just try not to laugh. And Louis Hatton's there from Rabbit Tech. He had to walk away. He couldn't, he couldn't keep straight face. Anyway, for the rest of that trip, Mark was moaning about this fish that just could how he didn't know how he could have got it so wrong. How could he have been three kilos off? Anyway, the guys didn't tell him. I told him when we went to Tahiti on the next trip, like three months later, um, they're telling him about it. And you were so pissed off and we really had a good laugh. It was one of the funniest things I've ever seen. <laughs> so don't take your weighing too seriously. Someone might have slipped a, <laughs> exactly. a weight into the fish's mouth. Oh, uh, it was a hysterical story though, yeah. For our long-time listeners out there, who remembers the episode with Michael Takash and Jesse Cripps? Well, Tacker, the cover tart, is at it again. <laughs> he's he's on the cover of Spearing Magazine. I just had a look at his uh, his website for uh, Underwater Ally Productions, and he, he's been on just about every magazine in the world, but he's been on Spearing Magazine a couple of times, and uh, Jesse's responsible for those great shots of him. And if you'd like to know more about Spearing Magazine, head to spearingmagazine.com and check out this wonderful publication. We love it, don't we, Shrek? Yep, and uh, just like you said, Tacker gets more covers on Spearing Magazine than you've had covers on Grinder. (laughs) 
<laughs> head over to Spearing Magazine and it's... check out probably the world's highest quality spearfishing publication. <laughs> All right, uh, our next section um, is dive bag. Now, we've spoken a lot about uh, the equipment that you use, but we might go into depth uh, in your dive bag. Um, we, we usually start from uh, sort of head to toe, but we'll start with uh, with your guns. So, what are your? Let's just start with your go-to gun that you're using at the moment. So, my go-to guns are 1.1 meter Rabi Tech roller gun mm-hmm. um, with a kicker band when I need it, and I have a Rob Allen roller head on it. I know Rabi Tech is going to launch their new roller head, and then I probably use that. I'm quite loyal to Rabi Tech. Uh, I live. Near Louis, I'm good friends with him. He makes very, very good guns. His handles and his new trigger mechanisms are the best on the market. Um, so that's my go-to gun. If I went on a long trip uh, with big fish, I'd take my Alemani. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that's a 1.3. It has big spears, nine to nine and a half millimeter diameter spears. It's an inverted roller. It has slip tips and double barbs. I'd use a slip tip for, for generally on that gun as well. So you can you know, land a lot more fish. Um, I like the Rife Blue Water slip tips. They're probably some of the best on the market. Um, they're expensive, but they work well. And then uh, my middle gun would be a Rabi Tech 1.3 or 1.4 double rubber with 16 mil rubbers on it that I would use for, you know, kill shots or for hunting on the reef and that kind of thing as well. Okay, wow. Yeah, good selection of guns there. Um, yeah, we might have to link up some Rabi Tech gear because it's it's not it's not something that we talk about a lot actually uh, the Rabi Tech stuff, but it sounds like they've made some really nice improvements. Uh, okay, let's have a look at uh, fins. What sort of fins are you using? So I've tried a number of different fins. Now I've gone with a. There's a chap called um, Pierre Liebenberg. His brand is Spear S P I E R R E, uh-huh. and uh, he unfortunately lives in 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 the Eastern Cape in quite a small town. So it takes him quite a while to get a pair of fins made for you. You send him your height and your weight, and he actually builds a pair of fins for you based on your wow. your, your dimensions. Um, Adrian dives in them, Mark dives in them, I dive in them. Um, they're brilliant fins, very robust as well. Uh, it's not a very commercial operation though, so you're not gonna be able to walk into a, pair, into a shop and buy them, you have to order them from him. Usually I send him the booties that I like, the boots, and then he'll build the carbon fin into that. But they're very, very good fins, and I often find a pair of fins out there that's, that comes close to that. I have bought myself a, a pair of Seldomar, the new Seldomar um, spearfishing fins, yeah. and they'll arrive in November. I want to try them out. I was with a Seldomar agent in Panama diving a lot with his stuff, and they had some brilliant kits, so I bought some of that while I was there from, from him. Yeah, lovely. All right. Uh, wetsuit? So I'm, I'm a, uh, I've got uh, three hex wetsuits. I don't know if you've yeah. seen these hex yeah. wetsuits, the New Zealanders, H-E-C-S. Yeah. Um, it's a stealth screen. You know, it's a very robust wetsuit, which I like. Um, so it, it looks like it's going to wear well. Uh, I've got a one and a half, a three mil, and a five mil. And they're very warm suits as well. I find I can dive in the three mil of that suit uh, without uh, um, when the other guys are in their five mils, and I'm very warm. I, I'm in, I took the extra large. I'm six foot five and I weigh 105 kilos. Okay. So I did ask them to add in a little bit on the, the arms and on the legs because I had bought one that I just realized needed a bit of extra length. But they fit incredibly well. Hmm. Mark's got one now, Jamie's got one, and so is Ardron, and we're all loving them. So okay. uh, I, the jury's still out on whether the stealth screen actually makes a huge difference. But this weekend, Mark shot some amazing fish, and he said they were a very wary white muscle cracker, and he reckoned he was definitely a little bit um, – the fish were coming closer than they normally do. So I think this, there could be something to those suits. They're expensive, but they're very well made, so – yeah, well, it's it's interesting technology. It's probably the biggest thing to happen in spear fishing suits for a long time, and uh, it's interesting that you say that the white muscle cracker were probably a little bit tamer around them. I know uh, Travis Corkin here in Australia. He uh, was shooting a lot of mulloway or or cob with them, and uh, he couldn't speak highly enough. He said he, there was times he was actually within the schools and having the mulloway stack up on top of him. So. It's very, very interesting stuff, but uh, I'd, I'd be interested to get my hands on some hex, just saying. Um, all right. Yeah, so. Warren, Bird, I mean, Warren Bird's a good guy. I'm in touch with him, the owner, and uh, I bought three suits from him. So, 
he really is a good chap. I can uh, give you his details. And, he, and I think that suits up. The thing I like about them is you know, spearfishing is a very rough sport. It's hard on your gear. Yeah. I like a wetsuit that doesn't tear too easily. I had an Elios. Well, I have an Elios suit, which is a phenomenal Chiclia suit, you know, out of Italy. Yeah. It's probably for free diving the best wetsuit you can get. But the first time a fish's fin touches it, it just slices open, you know. Yeah. Um, so if you're shooting a lot of fish, you, you can't, you know, you, you sometimes need to wrap your arms around it to subdue a big fish. And then you come out and you have to take the wetsuit off and put another one on because it's ripped so badly, you know. That's no, that's no good for me. So um, you, you mentioned that you, you don't like stuff that, that rips. Gloves and booties, have you found something that lasts? Uh, not really. Eh? So they're, they're more consumables. Yeah. So booties, I always get my booties made up by Rabitec where they put a good thick layer of silicone on the bottom of the feet. Yeah. And a good tip is when you get a new pair of booties, um, poke a hole in the end of where your big toe is. Between your big toe and your second toe, get a knife and stick it through there and make a hole. That way when your wetsuit drains into your booties, all the water will go and flow out of that hole. So you don't get these booties swelling up on your feet when you're on the boat. That's a very useful tip. As soon as I buy a pair of booties, I poke a hole in the toes, in both of the feet, and that makes a big difference. Um, but yeah, booties are just going to go through. So you know they're going to last you less than a season. Yeah. Gloves, um, I, I use those gardening gloves. Uh, you know, Generally, if it's cold, I'll use a, a pair of a coral wetsuits uh, with a bit of um, leather on the inside. So you know, keep your hands warm. But uh, yeah, generally, those are, are quite – you just want them not to be too bulky and, and they must fit well. But badly fitting gloves and booties are a hassle. You need them to, to fit properly. Yeah. Okay. And uh, and you mentioned that you you like the uh, Rob Allen uh, belt reel. Uh, I'm gonna guess here the uh, Rob Allen uh, weight belt. No, uh, there's a weight belt called that made by I think it's a company in either Greece or Italy called Alchemy. It's the best weight belt made in the world. Wow. It's a silicone weight belt, so you have to order it online from them, and it stretches hugely. So compared to a normal rubber weight belt, it stretches two to three times as much. Wow. So it's incredibly comfortable when you put it on. Um, and I've got two of them. I keep one in the Eastern Cape and one here, and I only dive in that. And every guy I dive with looks at it and says, geez, where did you get that weight belt? I want one. Yeah. So they're fantastic weight belts. Alchemy is the company. I bought a set of their fins. I wasn't that excited about their fins. They were too flexible for me. I need stiffer fins. I'm a big guy. I need to be able to drive through the water. Mm -hmm. They were too too flexy, even though I ordered their stiff ones. So, But the weight belt's second to none. And it makes a massive difference having a really comfy weight belt. Yeah, right. I've never even heard of them. We'll, we'll uh, link them around up. Yeah, and, and I guess it, it helps you with breathing and all that kind of thing too, being nice and flexible. Uh, mask and snorkel. I think that's all the only thing that's left. So yeah, I use an Omer Alien mask. I have four of those, two here and two in the Eastern Cape, and I always just dive in the same mask and a simple snorkel, you know, like a Spora sub snorkel that just attaches at the back of the mask, and I just I keep that same mask. It's quite a low-volume mask. Uh, it never leaks. Um, it's yeah, it's just a very good all round, and I use the camo one generally, the camo green or the camo uh, grey one. Yeah, well, you don't you don't want the fish to see your, your face. What the, um, so? Uh, what about the uh, the dive knife? The oh, oh, I missed that. Yeah, I use a Rob Allen or a Rabbit Tech, one of those dive knife sheaths that go right against your leg, so they're low profile, they don't stick out and cause any drag. And I just have one of those with that, you know, those nice sort of flat sheaths with the two pieces of elastic that go around your leg. Um, Audrey always has his knife on his arm. I think it's just a preference of where you like it. And then I always tie my knife onto my um, sheath as well. And I probably have about 30 centimeters to 40 centimeters of line that I can wrap around through the elastic so it's not flapping around anywhere. But then you don't lose your knife all the time. Yep. Okay. No, that's good advice. Uh, mate, there's only, there's only one piece of advice I want to know about now, and that is – uh, you travel a lot. You've traveled all over the world spearfishing. How do you keep your gear safe when you're traveling? So, yeah, I have a Spora sub case, or I think it's called a sport tube. Um, we all bought those, and we put our guns and, and our fins into that, and that keeps it uh, protected because the, the number of times I've had fins broken traveling is, is, is a disaster, you know. Yeah. Um, but that, that helps a lot. And then lock up your bags and have a good dive bag, um, wrap everything up in your wetsuits. And, um, yeah, you, the main thing is just they lose your bag sometimes. There's nothing worse than getting to a dive destination and your kit doesn't arrive with you. It's a terrible feeling. I've had it. 
Yeah, no, definitely. Especially when you're in some of the locations that you go to, it's it'd be absolutely horrible. All right, I think that uh, wraps up our dive bag. Now here we, this is the the segment of the show that I like the least. But uh, Shrek wrote down some of these um, philosophical questions, and um, he just loves asking these questions. And um, I like taking the piss out of him. And since he's not here, here we go. So get ready, Chris. These are absolute. Um, these are absolute beauties. <laughs> Could you describe what the spearfishing experience means to you in one sentence? <laughs> yeah, freedom and peace. Eh? So there's nothing like being underwater because you're completely free down there. You, you know, the, the noise of life, the worries, the stress, it all just evaporates and and fun. Eh? You're underwater there. You, you, you're trying to be as calm as possible, so it's almost a meditative state. Um, and, yeah, to me it's uh, the most enjoyable experience sport that you can do. Very good. All right, if you if you could go back in time to when you were just starting spearfishing and give yourself some advice, what would you say? Well, I definitely teach myself how to breathe because that's yep. you know, I don't know how it took me till forty five years old to learn how to breathe up. And I know it's maybe not the, the the technique that works for everyone, but for me, it took me from being comfortable at fifteen to twenty five meters. So it would really be breathing up properly. Yeah? Okay. And uh, what's this one? What current challenges do you face in your spearfishing and how are you approaching them? Well, I've had a very um, patient wife for the last three months. I've been traveling around the world. <laughs> and actually, I must tell you the other scariest moment of my spearfishing, it involves my wife. Um, so trying to convince my wife that going away for long periods of time to shoot fish is very therapeutic for my mind <laughs> and good for my body. And it seems to be wearing a little bit thin. So that's my main challenge is trying to convince my wife to let me go. Um, yeah, I've got the most uh, beautiful and, and loving wife in the world, but sometimes her patience does wear a little bit thin with my passion. Mm-hmm. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, it's uh, the, the scariest moment I've actually ever had spearfishing was when I'd been in French Polynesia and New Zealand in August for three weeks, and we just got back on the Friday, and I left for Panama for two weeks on the Sunday night. <laughs> and that was definitely one of the scariest moments in spearfishing I've ever had. Not a popular man. <laughs> because my was so cross. <laughs> but anyway, um, yeah, so that is my current challenge. Oh, that sounds like I think there's a lot of people in that boat. All right, uh, I'll, I'll ask one more of uh, Shrek's questions. Um, this is probably a, uh, where are we? Okay. Who is the best person to go spearfishing with and why? I probably have to say Mark and AK. Um, you know, both of them push me to 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 really shoot good fish. They always get amazing fish. So when you're with them, you know there's going to be some fantastic fish shot. They always got a good sense of humour. They both know how to find fish as well. So they can look at a fish finder and tell you, dive here, you'll shoot fish, and you always do. They've got a sixth sense, and they've just got an unbelievable ability to read a fish finder and be able to find good structure that holds good fish. So you get diving with them and you really get great fish and that's part of, to me, what I'm there for. Yeah, 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 good advice. Well, Chris, I think that's, uh, that's every question I have there to ask to you, to you today, mate. You've, you've shared some absolutely fantastic advice with us. Um, mate, is there any parting piece of advice that uh, you, you would like to um, give Spiros out there anywhere in the world today? Yeah, so I've been searching the world trying to find the spearfishing nirvana and, uh, and, and and sadly, there is no nirvana. There are a lot of really good places. So I've dived French Polynesia. That's one of the best places in the world to get big doggies and wahoo and some amazing reef fish. I'd say take a trip out there when you get a chance one day. And you could join Rob Torelli in Tonga. I believe it's quite similar. He does good charters out there. Yeah. Um, I've dived Panama. Panama. And Panama, the word means abundance of fish. So any country that's word means the abundance of fish is somewhere you need to go as often as possible. Yeah. And there's a great guy there called Enrique Unitide. I can send you his details. Excellent. He doesn't really do charters. He's more of a landowner. And he's a young guy. He's probably 37, 38. Brilliant diver. And he knows Panama spearfishing like nobody else. He's from Spain and he's just a fantastic guy. So if you want to charter a trip out to Panama, he'd be a guy to go with. I'm going back. So, yeah, and then I traveled the world and someone asked me, where was your best spearfishing in that three-month sabbatical? It's actually in South Africa in Richards Bay. 
which, I mean, it's bizarre. You travel the world and your best two days you have in, in your backyard. So wow. I think enjoy, you know, every country has its, its pros and cons. And, and uh, sometimes we take our own backyard for granted. So I really don't do that anymore. I realize South Africa's got phenomenal spearfishing. You have to have a bit of a strong stomach for sharks because we do have sharks here like you do in Australia. But um, I think here yeah, they're possibly even worse. Mm -hmm. So and just be sensible. Don't dive in dirty water here. You know, so ha have those sort of rules that you stick to. You know, we, we make sure um, we, we don't dive in stress by when the water's mud. We don't. We dive if there's 15 meter vis, we dive. If there's not, we don't dive because you will get bitten like Renee Nell, our friend who was on the show, re previously found out. Uh, and that was, they were chancing their arm and, and, and they got bad to pay for it. Then. Right, Chris, thanks so much for coming on the show, mate. Um, you've shared an absolute ton of knowledge, mate, and, uh, and we, we'll... Uh, where can people reach out and link up with you? You're on Facebook. You're on the on social media. Yeah, I'm on media. Facebook. Chris, Chris Dillon. I don't have an H in my name, so it's C R I S and then Dillon in South Africa. So yeah, reach out to me. I'm friends with a lot of your guys, like Ian Puckridge and and Rob Torelli on Facebook. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm always keen to dive uh, with people when they come to South Africa. Hook up with me. I'll take you out. And um, yeah, I love diving. So. Um, yeah, look forward to, to, to being one of those guys who's shoot, still shooting great fish in his 80s. Eh? Yeah, mate, absolutely. All right, Chris, thanks for coming on the show. Thanks, Turbo. Say hi to Shrek for me, and you guys are going to come out here and stay with Niall and I soon, so we can look forward to hosting you. We'll take you out for Yellowfin in Cape Town, we'll take you to Stray Spy to shoot Yellowtail, oh. and we'll take you to the Eastern Cape to shoot the White Muscle Cracker, the Black Muscle Cracker, and the elusive White Stenbrus, which I still haven't managed to shoot, but I'm going to get one soon. <laughs> oh, sounds awesome, mate. Can't, can't, I can't believe it. I'm, I'm looking forward to it. So, uh, 29 I'll some pictures of my house that you can use while you're there as well. So, I think you'll enjoy that. Oh, so, thanks so much. All right. Thanks, Chris. Okay, mate. Take it easy, yeah. Thanks for tuning in, guys. I hope you got something out of today's episode with Chris Dillon. A massive thank you to Chris. Thank you for coming on the show, mate. I had a ball. It was my first solo episode. I even got the time zone wrong and had to quickly wake up, splash some water on my face and uh, and get the show going. So uh, big thanks to Chris. Thanks for being gentle with me on my first solo episode. Now, if you like today's episode, we've got more in store for you next fortnight with uh, Andrew Hafoka. I think I got it right, but I'm not sure. Um, yeah, so great episode. He's over in New Zealand, a good one of our Kiwi spearfishing mates. Um, he's an underwater hockey enthusiast, and he talks to us all about that side of things. And once again, guys, thanks. We couldn't do the show without you um, tuning in every fortnight and listening to us embarrass ourselves in front of some of the world's greatest spearos. Uh, big thank you to Adreno and uh, keep an eye out for their Easter sale. Save yourself some money and keep an eye out for our Kickstarter campaign to get 99 tips um, out the door and on shelves and in your hands. Thanks again, guys. Happy spearfishing. Never dive alone and we hope you bag some big ones.